The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, performance engineering and pretty much how to do that uh, with the uh, Profiling tools. And we're gonna uh, the so first first we're gonna talk about you know how what profiling tools are and sort of how you use them in general and what the theory of that is. And then uh, more sort of importantly, we're gonna do an interactive walkthrough of um, two examples that we picked out. The first one is the matrix multiply that you guys saw in Project Zero uh, with the um, cash ratio measurements and how to do those measurements and how to do the you know uh, cycles per instruction measurements these kinds of things. And then, um, then we're going to look at doing some of the, the bit hacks that Charles talked about in the second lecture. Uh, we're going to work on uh, a branchless sorting algorithm, which is pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> so the, the projects we gave you, uh, the, the code we gave you in project one uh, was very, it was very obvious where the hotspot was. Uh, but real life doesn't really work that way. And uh, you know, code gets really, really big. And, when you want to, you know, it's not always obvious where, you know, where the part is that you want to optimize. And you really don't want to waste time uh, taking what is otherwise, you know, understandable good code and, you know, beating it over the head trying to make it go faster. Um, so that's why, you know, Donald Kuhn said premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, you really want to focus on, you know, the hot spots. <clears throat> and so that's what, that's what profiling is for. It basically uh, takes your, you know, gives you visibility into the execution of your code because it would be too complicated to just sit down and look at it and try to understand where, the, where, where, you know, where it's spending its time. And you know, there are many possibilities for, for where it could be spending its time. Uh, in 6172, we're mostly going to be focusing on uh, you know, things that are CPU bound and things that are uh, you know, using the memory hierarchy ineffectively. Um, but in, you know, in the real world, there's a couple of, you know, couple of other common things are um, you know, network requests. So if you've got your web application, it's making a whole bunch of AJAX requests. Uh, it's going to be wasting a lot of uh, your user's time. Um, you know, if you've got your desktop application, it's hitting the disk all the time. That's also going to slow you down. Um, I think SQL databases, if anybody's ever done web development, uh, you know, they know that can be a huge bottleneck. Um, and yeah, so the, basically, the, the tool that you're going to use is going to uh, depend a lot on what the problem you're solving is. But, uh, but the, the basic ideas are all the same. There are you know, all kinds of profiling tools for uh, measuring these things and figuring out uh, where it's coming from and where the time's going. So for, for looking at uh, CPU, you know, trying to figure out CPU and memory, there's a couple, couple things you can do. The first and most basic and sort of you know, most obvious to you guys is you, know, you can insert, do manual instrumentation. And what that is is basically where you go in and you put in prints and try to figure out where it's spending its time, you know, what code's getting executed more, um, or more, you can be a little bit more clever, you can try to insert, you know, like, logging calls uh, that you know, fill up a buffer with like, uh, checking the time and actually doing that yourself. Um, and you know, the, one of the, the big advantages of that is that you, when, you, when you actually go into the code and you instrument it yourself, you can cut down the information that's coming back out, out at you. If you have an intuition for how the program works, uh, you know, sprinkling little calls to timing functions around your code in the, the places that you think matter um, is going to give you maybe a better picture. Um, but it requires more work on your part. So that's, that's the drawback. <clears throat> the other kind of instrumentation is uh, static instrumentation, which is basically, and I should say that instrumentation is basically a, a snippet of code that is you know, gathering information, gathering data uh, about the code execution. Um, but so static instrumentation is basically code that's inserted by the compiler uh, when you build your code. Uh, and gprof is an example of this. Uh, basically what it does is it will, at the prologue and uh, epilogue for every function, it'll insert a little piece of code that increments a counter every time the function gets executed. Uh, I think it also figures out who called it, that kind of thing. Um, one of the drawbacks to static instrumentation is that you have, to, you have to have the source and you have to be able to rebuild your project. Uh, if you've ever you know, had a DLL, uh, you know, just binary blob of data you know, library handed to you, uh, and you want to know where the time's going in that library, uh, you're not going to be able to instrument it. So you're not going to get any data. <clears throat> so that brings us to the next thing, which is dynamic instrumentation, which solves that problem. Um, 
basically what happens there is you take the you take the binary as it is at runtime, you know, just just before you're about to run it, and before you start executing, you actually just take a look at the code and translate it, and you go in and you insert the instrumentation, and then you have this new snippet of code that you then run instead. Um, and so that works for binary blobs, but and it doesn't require a recompile, which is great, but uh, it in introduces a lot of overhead um, because you're not actually running the original code, right? <laughs> um, you're you're running this this uh, translated thing, which might be much more inefficient. Um, and I guess Valgrind uh, has a couple of tools that are sort of classic examples of that: uh, call grind and cache grind. I think call grind gives you a call graph, and cache grind uh, tries to tries to measure the cache effects, um, tries to make a prediction of when you do memory accesses, are these things in cache or not? Um, another thing you might want to look at are, uh, or the thing, that, the thing that we're going to focus on in this course are uh, performance counters. Um, and two, tool, two tools to get these are uh, O-Profile and Perf. And basically, the, the CPU has uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of counters. We've talked about them for branch misses, cache misses, these kinds of things. And the, this will give, give access to those. Um, the last tool that I guess I'm going to talk about for profiling is uh, uh, heap profiling. A lot of times, if you're, you know, if, if memory is your problem, uh, you really want to figure out uh, who's doing all the allocation, and so this will give you a nice. Uh, these tools will give you a nice uh, breakdown of um, who's who's allocating what, who's calling them, uh, and who can I stop calling so that I'm allocating less memory. And you know, you can find, like I said, you can find more tools for different kinds of uh, different profiling, different kinds of problems and resources. But today we're mostly going to focus on perf which is uh, a new tool for uh, getting access to performance counters on Linux. Um, I guess I should also mention that, uh, the, as Simon talked about in the last lecture, the way that you want to gather data from performance counters is you want to do event sampling. Um, there's too much data. Uh, as, you, as you execute along, you don't want to record, OK, I executed this, this instruction, then I executed that instruction, and you know, I'm going to count all the instruction executions and then store that data somewhere. That would be way too much data. So what you want to do is you want to uh, sample every so often, you know, every, every thousandth event or some other frequency um, for whatever your interesting event is. Um, and basically what happens is that uh, the, when you know, when, when, that, when that counter has hit, hit the threshold, uh, an interrupt will fire and the kernel will catch it, and then it will record uh, the, the, the data that you want, the context, like where in the execution it was, who, what the call stack looked like, these kinds of things. I think we've talked about, we've, we've covered uh, most, of, most of the performance counters that we mostly care about, but I think it's worth mentioning that um, there are a lot of performance counters, and you can you can go look them up in this this part of the uh, manual. Um, they they cover a lot of interesting things, not just the ones we talked about, um, including like sleep states, uh, power consumption, and like uh, if you want to look at contention, say you have two core, you know, you have uh, a parallel program, and you have two cores accessing the same data. They're going to be if they're writing back to it, they're going to be fighting over the same cache lines. And so there are counters for things like how many times did this core have to go look you know, go off core to get the cache line. Um, and all kinds of interesting things like that. Uh, but mostly we're gonna focus on the uh, cache misses, branch, miss, uh, branch misses. Um, I also wanted to mention that, so the tool we're using, Perf, uh, it kind of replaces O-Profile and Perfmon, which are tools that do similar things. Um, it's, I guess it's different in that it's a, a unified uh, interface to monitoring two kinds of events. Uh, the first are software uh, kernel events, so things like context switches. So how many times did your application make a system call and then get context switched out? Uh, and how many times did your, you know, how many page faults did your ap uh, application generate? Um, and I think, I don't know, like how many, you know, these kinds of things that the kernel knows about but aren't necessarily hardware events. And the other kind is hardware events. Uh, and those are sort of the ones we're gonna focus on. We've already talked about those. Um, if you wanna get this tool and try it out yourself, if you have any recent uh, Linux distribution, anything with a kernel that's less than a year old, um, you can install Linux tools, and the command is perf. So now we're gonna do a demo of uh, the matrix multiply from Project Zero. All right, so for the demos, I guess I'll narrate what the code's doing so Reed can focus on typing. Um, this code should look familiar. It's actually a uh, Intel microprocessor. Oh, no. Do you want this? I guess I can switch. 
All right, can everybody hear me? All right, cool. So this code should look very familiar. It's Project Zero's matrix multiply code, the original version. And it's a triply nested for loop for multiplying matrices. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to switch to a terminal that Reed is typing on. And we're going to run matrix multiply. And it takes about eight seconds to run. And now we're going to run it, but have perf um, output some performance uh, statistics for it, basically CPU counters. So you use dash E to request specific counters. You can use perf list, perf list to take a look at all the counters that perf supports. In this case, we're asking for the number of CPU cycles, the number of instructions, um, the number of L1 cache loads, and then the number of L1 cache misses. Perf stat. That's better. So it takes a little bit longer to execute, I think, with perf, but it's not supposed to be a big difference. You can see 8.31 versus 8.34. So it's relatively low overhead sampling, which is good, because you don't want to change the behavior of your program when you sample it. Um, important things to see. Uh, so we're looking at this cash miss rate, which is uh, 18%, almost 19% uh, L1 cache miss rate, which is pretty bad. So as a result of that, if you look at the number of instructions and number of cycles, um, perf calculates the IPC for you. We previously talked about CPI, but perf uses IPC, which is instructions per cycle. So it, basically, uh, every cycle you only executed half an instruction on average because you're waiting for the cache. So that's no good. So can anybody remember from Project Zero what, was, what, what you did to work around that? Yes? You reordered the loops. Yes. <laughs> so the before and after, you just swap out the inner two loops, and we will run it again. OK, so remember the previous runtime was eight seconds. Now it's down to 2.5 seconds, which is a lot better. Let's. Uh, run the perf stat command again and look at the performance counters. And as you can see, the IPC jumped from 0.49 to 1.4, so it tripled. And if you look at the new uh, L1 cache miss rate, it's 1% rather than uh, 20%, which is a lot better. So this is, yes? Oh, sorry about that. So. Uh, L1 decache loads is all of the times that the CPU asks the L1 cache for something. And then L1 decache load misses is the number of cache misses. So you divide this over this to get the ratio. Right, which is basically what we did over here. Does that make sense? OK. So, so this is a relatively, well, ridiculously simple example of how to use uh, perf just so that you can see the command set. But I mean, that's not really a very interesting example. So the next one that we looked at is, uh, we'll look at is actually something that Charles Reed and I did yesterday afternoon for fun. And <laughs> it started, uh, we were uh, testing your project 2.1, which is, uh, I don't know how many people have looked at the handout yet, but it deals with a bunch of mystery sorting algorithms that you have to figure out what they're doing. And so we took one of them, um, and we were running uh, sorting, and Charles asked, what happens if you have a branchless sorting algorithm? And we said, we don't know. So uh, we played around with it. And in the process, uh, we optimized our branchless sorting algorithm by using perf to generate insight into what the CPU is doing. And as you'll see, we generated quite a good speed up. So the first thing we'll do is let's start with the baseline, quicksort, everybody's favorite sorting algorithm. So I'll switch over to the terminal, and Reed is going to run quicksort on 30 million integers uh, one time, which it says takes 4.14 seconds. Now, uh, let's uh, use perfstat to see what it's doing. So this time we will ask for slightly different events. We'll still ask for the cycles and instructions to get our IPC, but we'll also ask for branches and branch misses because we kind of intuitively know that uh, quicksort is doing branching. So okay, so okay, uh, it's 
doing 0 0.8 IPC, so 0 0.8 instructions per cycle. And the uh, branch miss rate, so branch misses over total number of branches is 11.5%. That's, that's pretty bad in terms of branch missing. So uh, let's take a look at the code and see why that's the case. So here's the part of the code in QuickSort where you uh, select a pivot uh, recursively and then you uh, loop and then you uh, do the, your swapping. So these branches, these branches are more or less unpredictable and looking at them, there's no way that we could think of to, uh, to get rid of the uh, unpredictable branches. They're unpredictable by nature. So this would not be an interesting example of which to do uh, branchless sorting. So let's switch to a different algorithm, merge sort. So in merge sort, here's the relevant code in merge sort that uh, takes a list C and two input lists A and B, and you merge the contents of A and B into C by picking the smallest element from either A or B, putting it in C, and then repeating that process until the lists are empty. So the if else branches, as the comment says, uh, tries to place the min of the value either at A or B into C, and then properly uh, increment the pointer and do those housekeeping tasks so you don't uh, crash. So let's, we're gonna try running this and profiling it. So read is running merge sort. Took 5.04 seconds. Well, the last one took 4.18 seconds, so already it doesn't look too good. But uh, let's try to see what happened. So we'll issue the same uh, perf stat command asking for branches, branch misses, cycles, read is being lazy. Okay, so the IPC is 1.1, which is a little bit better, but if you look at the uh, branches, branch misses over branches, um, they're off by roughly a order, order of magnitude just like before, so 10%. So, okay. Merge sort is currently slower than quick sort. And the reason is still roughly, you, you still have you know, all of these uh, branches that you're not predicting correctly. So, okay, so why branching and why not caching? Well, we did some quick back of the envelope calculations, or research rather, and it turns out that in the Nehalem, the processors that you're using on the clouds, um, one of the, the design changes that Intel made is that they made the uh, L1 cache and actually also the L2 cache uh, faster, so lower, fewer number of clock cycles to go out to the cache. But at the same time, they also made the pipeline deeper. So an L1 cache miss is maybe three or four cycles, an L2 cache miss is 15 cycles. By the time you miss to L2 cache, you're going out into L3 cache, which is 12 megabytes, and if you're sorting integers, most of them are probably gonna be in there anyway. Oh, they are. Uh, okay, so the misses might be a little bit bigger than that, but okay. Okay. This is a L2. Right, it's an L2. It, right. So it's, L1 it's just L1 a time hit. Okay, so the next number is probably like 30 to 50, somewhere on, on that order. 50 something, okay. But a branch mystery deck will also cost you somewhere between 16 and 24 cycles, depending on how many uh, pipeline stages are actually in the Nehalem, which we don't know. Um, so bad branch predictions might just be as costly as uh, bad memory access patterns. And plus, Charles is gonna go into detail about memory access patterns and how to optimize sorting for good memory access. So it wouldn't be interesting if I talked about that right now. So let's optimize uh, branching. So to do that, we'll use a bit hack that uh, Charles introduced in an earlier lecture. So remember, all we want to do is we want C to, to uh, take, to put, we want to put the minimum of either A or B into C. So right now we're using branches to do it, but there's no reason why we have to. So the trick that we'll apply is the, uh, the XOR trick for calculating min without a branch. Does everybody kind of follow what, what that code is doing? You can refer to the bit hacks uh, lecture later to uh, check, but trust us that it's correct. <laughs> All right, I guess we can go over it. So do I have a mouse pointer? Cool, so okay, so inside you're doing, you're doing uh, comparing A is less than B, the value at A is less than the value of B, and you store either a zero or one into a flag called CMP. And then you take CMP and you negate it, so then you end up with a bit mask of either all zeros or all ones, depending on which one was smaller. 
and then you mask A, X, or B with that. So this inner expression, you either get A, X, or B out of it, or you get all zeros. And then you X or B into it. So in one case, B, X, or this expression cancels out the B, you'll just get A out. In the other way, B, B X, or zero is going to give you B. So that should be convincing motivation that this is actually a min function. And then once you have that, you can do cute tricks to recycle the flags to do the A plus plus and B minus, B plus plus, and so on using CMP. So next, let's run this code and see what happens. OK, so we went from 5.04 5 seconds to 4.59 seconds. And we'll do a profiling run just to get some stats on it. OK, so now look at the IPC. We went from 1.1 um, .1 to 1.7, 1.7. And branch misses went down by a factor of 10, which is really awesome. But overall, the performance didn't seem to improve by much. Um, well, if you want to look at why, look at the total number of instructions executed. Um, that's that number versus that number. Uh, we seem to be executing considerably more instructions. So um, to see why that's the case, we decided to use another mode of perf called report, or record and then report. So what this does is that it logs um, where all of those uh, interrupts actually happen. So it logs which point in your code with your CPU was executing when these performance counters tripped. And then it generates a nice report that we can call using perf uh, annotate. And the top line, the top section gives you a sorted summary where uh, it shows you the percent of times that perf caught your program executing that line of code. So 11% of the times that perf triggered its interrupt um, your code was executing merge sort.c line 32. So let's go to merge sort.c line 32 and see what it's doing. So this annotated view shows you the lines of C code, which are in black. C code is in black, and then uh, line numbers are annotated here. And then it actually goes ahead and shows you the assembly instructions that it's executing. Um, and it puts the timing actually on the assembly instructions corresponding to every C expression. Yes? Sir, why did this file be for one? Why did you open those? It's like the annotated version of yeah. yeah, this is, you call perf annotate and then a function name. Um, the project 2 1 will walk you through doing this a couple of times so you'll be able to see what it's doing. So, okay, so the assembly here is actually, uh, is actually pretty important. Um, I guess we've all taken, everybody's taken 6004 or some variant where you had to code some form of assembly. Okay, it's a prereq. Cool. So um, Saman will talk more about assembly, but in this case, or Charles actually now will talk more about assembly. Um, but anyway, in this case, it was actually kind of useful to look at the assembly. Um, we won't expect you to know how to write assembly for, for this class or expect you to write high performing assembly, but sometimes taking a look at what the compiler outputs can really help you. Well, in this case, what caught our eye was this CLTQ thing, because um, none of us sitting in the room knew what the heck CLTQ was. It wasn't an assembly instruction that you usually see. So that caught our eye, and we wondered, what was this assembly doing? So we spent a little bit of time tracing through this, uh, working out what the compiler was doing. So in PowerPoint, I, uh, I uh, pulled out this code. And OK, so I looked up CLTQ in my 600-page Intel manual. And <laughs> Yes, your processor does come with a manual. Um, so CLTQ, it says, sign extends the EAX register to 64 bits and then places that into RAX. Why is it sign extending? OK, so let's, let's try to trace through what the assembly is doing. So here, we wanted to do a comp equals star A less than star B. So it moves, it moves the value at, register, at the address in register 14 into RCX and does the same thing for register 13. So assume that R14 and R13 are A and B, and so RCX and RDX are star A and star B, right? And then it XORs ESI with ESI, which is zero, so it zeroes out the register ESI, and then it does a compare between RCX and RDX, which is the value at A and the value at B. So it does that comparison, 
And then depending on the result of that comparison, it writes that result out into register SIL. So SIL, yeah, as uh, Reed said, is the low byte of the register ESI, which is used here. But before that, the compiler then uh, executes this expression here, uh, BX or A, which it puts into register uh, RDX. And then finally, it takes ESI, which contains the same value as SIL, and then it moves that into EAX. And then it negates EAX. So OK, so that kind of looks like negative CMP, right? And then after negating it, it then sign extends it to a 64-bit register. And then it does the and mask that we asked it to. Well, why is it jumping through so many hoops to do this? Well, it turns out when you declare a value of type int, uh, you say that it's a 32-bit value. And the compiler took you very literally in saying that you requested a 32-bit value. So it did a 32-bit negation, and then it extended that to 64 bits. So it wasted a couple of instructions uh, doing this instead of just flat out doing a 64-bit negation to begin with. Now, the problem with, uh, with this is usually you don't care if it generates one extra assembly instruction. But this is a tight loop that's called uh, in, the, in the recursion process for every single merge that it's doing. So the time that it wastes here actually really adds up. So how do we fix that? Well, let's, uh, instead of declaring it as int, let's just try replacing it with long and then recompile the code and see if things are any different. So here we start our process of trial and error. So we compiled merge sort long. And the runtime is 4.05 seconds. Before it was like 4.5 or so. So the runtime definitely improved. Let's compare it. So it went from 4.59 to 4.05, which definitely is an improvement. So let's figure out, well, let's see if it uh, generated better assembly. So we'll run perf record to, in order to uh, look at perf annotate again. And OK, once again, it's spending 14% of the time somewhere in merge sort.c, which is hardly surprising. We're, we'll go to line uh, 27. And yeah, uh, use long. OK, so that's roughly the assembly. And read, although he wasted the time to find it, I'll, uh, I have a uh, nicely prepared screenshot of the same section of code. So it looks cleaner. Um, it compares, uh, it loads uh, A and B into different registers this time, actually, RSI and RCX. And then it clears out EDX. And then it does the compare between RSI and RCX, which is A and B. And then it sets uh, percent DL. Now, percent DL is the lower byte of EDX. Um, so it used a different choice of registers. And then it did the A, X, or B. And then it uh, moved that result. Uh, move that uh, compare into RAX. OK, and Reed actually has a longer snippet of the code. And then the compiler actually, now that uh, we uh, told it that it was a 64-bit flag, the compiler realized that there's a couple optimizations that it could do. So it switched around the order of things a little bit. And it's recycling the value of RDX for, uh, for loading, uh, I think it's A plus equals comp. It's recycling the value RDX that it uh, generated out of the compare. And now it's uh, down there, it's negating RAX as a 64-bit uh, number and directly using it without that CTLQ instruction. So that was kind of nice. So in just nudging the compiler a little bit, we got it to produce code that uh, ran uh, roughly about 10% faster, which, is, which was surprising to us, actually, that changing a single int to a long could reduce the runtime by that amount. So, Next thing that we did was we scrolled down a little bit more on this window, and we looked at the next thing that the compiler was doing. And we kind of caught the compiler again doing something silly. So here's the code that we were at before, the compare code. And now let's look at how uh, the compiler did B plus equals CMP. Uh, once again, the reason that we stopped and looked at this code was we saw an instruction that we didn't recognize, SBB. Well, we looked at the manual again, and SBB of arg1 and arg2 is a subtra subtract with a borrow bit. So it does uh, subtracting uh, the two arguments and then subtracting a carry flag from that. So, okay, why is it doing that? 
Well, let's walk through what the compiler tried to do. So um, let's see, where's a good place to start? So it's RDX uh, in this compare. So it compares RDX to uh, 1. RDX is where uh, CMP was stored. So it checks whether or not it equals to 1. And then the, the result of that check is actually stored in the carry flag, CF. And subtract with borrow, RAX, RAX. Um, before, RAX held the uh, value of B. But now, since it did this, RAX minus RAX is 0, right? And then minus the carry flag is either 0 or, or negative 1, depending on the value of the, of the uh, compare. So once again, it generates a register that's either uh, all zeros or all ones, 64 bits. Now, what did it go and do with that? Well, jump down a little bit later on in the code, and it ends EAX, which is the 32-bit version of RAX, with the value 8 in hexadecimal. And so now it's either all zeros or it's 8. And then it uses, it adds, RA, it adds um, that value, EAX, which is the same as RAX. RAX is a 64-bit version. It adds that value to RBP, which stored uh, the address of B. So it jumped through that many ho hoops just to increment B by either 8 or 0. Now, this seems a little bit unnecessary. So we thought, how else could we express um, B plus equals not CMP and try to, make, try to uh, change the code around a little bit so that it does the same thing but hope that the compiler treats it differently? Well, in this case, not CMP when CMP is either 1 or 0 is the same thing as 1 minus CMP. So, OK, well, we uh, compiled a version of this code, and then we tried to run it. <laughs> yeah. So, OK, refreshing our memory. Merge sort minus, where we just uh, did the, did the, uh, did the uh, minus sign. Um, so we took the runtime down from 4.04 .04 seconds to 3.77 seconds. And once again, this is just from uh, replacing a, uh, a minus, a uh, not CMP to a one minus CMP. That's all the code change that we made. And we will look at the uh, annotation again. And just to make sure that the compiler generated different code, rather we were curious what the compiler generated this time. <laughs> and yep, so it's roughly this section of code. Now, one thing you'll notice is because we're compiling with, uh, this is already compiling with GCC's maximum optimization level, mind you. So uh, keep that in mind when you uh, assume that the compiler is going to help you out and do smart things. Um, so uh, the instructions are a little bit out of order compared to what you might expect. So. I'm just looking for, I think, I think it's up here somewhere. All right, so I'll go to my uh, prepared <laughs> screenshot of the code. So. What did it generate this time? <laughs> All right, so already this code looks shorter than the previous one, right? A little bit less hairy than that. So what did it do? Well, uh, SIL, once again, is, is the lower uh, byte of RSI. So it does the compare RCX with RDX, which is actually this comparison. And then it saves that into SIL. And now later, uh, it does the XOR and then uh, so this was the code from before, and then it does uh, a move of RSI, which contains the same value as SIL, which is CMPs either 1 or 0. It moves that into RAX, and then, um, and then uh, later on, it, it uh, uses uh, RAX for one calculation, um, and then it also uh, uses the value that's already in RSI, and it subtracts that from register 14 which is where it decided to, to store the value of B. So that's a much more direct way to either subtract 0 or 1, actually get just 0 or 1, and then use it for a subtraction. So the end result, and something else to point out, is that uh, the move and subtract commands uh, have a little bit of instruction level parallelism, because right after you set LE SIL, as soon as that's done, you can execute both the move and the subtract at the same time, since they use the same uh, source register and put in different destination registers. And the other thing to notice uh, in the comparison is the number of ALU operations. I'll go back to the original one. Um, you see uh, negate, and, XOR, 
add. So move is not a ALU, it's not an arithmetic operation. But everything else is either XOR, AND, add, or subtract, or compare, which all use the ALU. Now, if you look at the code over here, um, you have move, 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 which don't need the ALU, and then the rest, the other four or five need the ALU. But having fewer ALU op is a good thing. Um, if you remember from the previous lecture on CPU architecture, the Nehalem has six execution ports, so it can execute six uh, micro ops in parallel uh, per CPU clock cycle. Actually, only three of those uh, execution ports have ALUs on them so that they can actually do uh, XOR, add, AND, subtract, add, and so on. The rest of them can do register moves and a couple of other things, but not er uh, arithmetic operations. So that's a good thing. So that's an explanation of why the code actually sped up. Now, just as an overview of uh, what we were able to do, we uh, ran perf stat, the same thing that we did for merge sort, or for the original two merge sorts, and we uh, made a table of the improvements that we made. So originally, uh, quick sort ran in four seconds, and it had an IPC of 0.8 and 10%, 11% branch missing. So when we switched from quick sort to standard merge sort, we uh, increased execution time by 20%, which is not good. And, but the instructions per, per clock jumped up a little bit. Branch miss rate is still pretty bad. Now, as soon as we switched it to branchless, uh, we got an 8% improvement over the previous runtime, but note that we were still worse off than quicksort at that point. But, whoops. But the uh, instructions per clock jumped quite a bit from last time, which is kind of what you would expect with branch, with uh, reducing the branch misses by a factor of 10, so the CPU isn't spending enough uh, extra time uh, stalling the pipeline trying to uh, backtrack on its uh, branch mispredicts. And now, the more interesting thing to me is if you look at uh, the two silly little compiler optimizations we made, um, switching from int to long reduced the runtime by 11% over the previous branchless implementation. And then uh, instructions per clock and branch miss both didn't change at this point. At this point, we were just reducing the number of instructions. And then uh, going from there to uh, changing not CMP to one minus CMP um, reduced our runtime by another 7% from before. So overall, branchless merge sorting is 10.8% faster than quick sorting by the time we were done optimizing which is a lot better than, uh, than uh, negative. At this point, we were still behind, and at the end, we ended up ahead of quick sort. And then overall, uh, switching to branchless with all the uh, performance tweaks that we made was 33.6% better over the uh, branching version. So the non-branching uh, ran a third faster than the, than the branching version, which is pretty cool. And that's something that we learned at the end of the day yesterday. So. To conclude, uh, what did we learn when we, were, when we were doing this? Well, I think a lot of that applies to uh, the p-sets that you're doing and how you should go about uh, optimizing performance on the code that we give you. And it's profiled before you optimize. So before you uh, spend too much time just reading through source code and making wild guesses as to why the code is slow, um, profile the code. See why it's actually slow. Get some performance counter data. Um, do some, uh, do some perf annotate so that it tells you what, what assembly or what line of code that it's actually uh, spending the most time on. And then optimize iteratively. Don't try to do everything at once. Do things one at a time to see whether or not they make a difference. Now, before we arrived at like the, uh, the uh, not, there are so many different ways that you could have expressed uh, not and one minus and negative and so on. So if you try them all at once, you really don't know what made the improvement. So you gotta try things one at a time and see what it causes the compiler to do because um, uh, even you can see in the previous two examples, by the time we made that one optimization, it wasn't just that one assembly instruction that the compiler ended up changing. The compiler, in fact, uh, realized that it could do additional optimizations on top of what we hinted to it, so it did even more optimizations. But the bottom line is uh, you should optimize iteratively. Try something and see what effect it has before uh, moving on and trying something else. And then. As much as I don't like coding assembly and I don't expect that anybody here codes assembly for the class, looking at the assembly is always a good thing. 
um, just skim through it and for, uh, for your performance bottlenecks and try to get an idea of what the compiler uh, is asking the CPU to do and see if there's a way that you can nudge the compiler to do the right thing. You know, sometimes we tell you the compiler will uh, optimize certain things, will get rid of dead code and so on. And most of the times that's actually true, but it doesn't hurt to double check in the assembly and make sure that it's actually doing that. And the output from perf is pretty, is pretty helpful to doing this. It's not a monumental task of disassembly. It, it does all of the annotation and interleaving for you. And finally, um, learn through practice. There's, that's the only way to, uh, to learn how to do this uh, performance optimization. You gain a lot of experience from just going out and trying the tools. And Project 2 will have you working with these tool tools. Um, Project 2.1 does not have a uh, code submission. It's just a write-up where you get to just play around with the tools on code that we give you so you can see how to use the tools. And then Project 2.2, uh, which is going out next week, will actually give you a chance to try to optimize code that we give you um, using these tools to help you out along the way. So with that said, any questions about? Um, on Stellar, so the, uh, the, the handouts for the write-ups are Stellar homework assignments. Just upload a PDF to Stellar. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you just have um, to build. You just have to build the, the binary with debug info. Yeah, minus G is enough. As long as like GDB, GDB's uh, breakpoints can see your code, um, then perf can do it. And it's actually pretty nice in that even if your code is inlined, it can identify uh, where the inline portions came from and pull in the proper lines of code for that. I think what's really interesting and important here is the. Not that they found this interesting thing, but the process they went about. A lot of times when you're coding, you are in control. You have a very planned structure how you are going about doing that, and you follow this through and, and, and produce the code you want, and sometimes some pesky bugs show up, you go through that. Here is basically, you basically let the system and data drive what you're doing. And, and when you start, you shouldn't, it's, there's no planned path saying I'm going to do A, B, C, D. Basically, you look at, you look at the results and you figure out what might change and you can go through that. And uh, I was actually t uh, talking with Charles saying, my, in my first lecture, I talked about matrix multiply. It looks really cool. Every time I do something, it improved by a factor of two, 50%, stuff like that. What you didn't see is all the things I did that didn't have any impact on the program. Okay, you saw this nice tree going down there. That there's all these leaves that was, uh, end up in dead ends that had nothing happen. So, so if you feel like when you go there, you do a bunch of things, nothing happens, that's normal. Of course, when you tell somebody, you don't probably, you're not going to say, oh, the other 10 things. You say, yeah, I did this, it worked, and I did that. And, and at the end, it, it looks like these other people are very smart, and they're getting through all this optimization. No, they spend a lot of time going through these dead end parts. And an interesting thing is in here, is one thing is don't trust anything. <laughs> I mean, it's in the compiler, oh yeah, I mean, I mean, Intel, they have hundreds of engineers working at it for years, and okay, it has to be good. Uh, not really. So, so a lot of times it's the end-to-end -end thing, because performance is end-to-end. -end. So the problem can't be at any level. So it could be a compiler, it could be, if you are doing network, it can be network, it can be an operating system, it can be in the memory system, it can be the process, it can be anywhere. So if you say, oh yeah, yeah, that shouldn't be the case, Probably that's where it is. So all the time, basically, it's interesting. The nice thing about uh, these kind of tools is that sometimes the, even the tools might be wrong. So, so sometimes I have been in a situation where you actually look at the wall, wall clock and say, okay, wait a minute, does the tool say what I actually see what's happening? Because uh, uh, you get into very skeptical situations because a lot of times in these kind of situations, the problem can be hidden in many different things. So that's a very good way of, of going through this. At, of course, this, what you get, hand to you, we have set it up in a way that it, there cannot be too many surprises. But when you're going through a system and try to optimize and, and, and look at performance, this is a really good way of doing it. Because I don't think these guys thought when they started, they'll be looking at compiler bugs or compiler problems. I mean, they were thinking about, OK, I'm going to do some uh, little bit of code rewriting and get there. But at the end of the day, what they discovered was very surprising to them, and it even surprised me today. Our plan basically ended at row three as far as when we first set out. We had no idea what was to follow after that. 
So one thing that I remember is that uh, some students uh, came to us and asked questions. It's like, yeah, I tried to implement this bit hack here and it actually slowed the program down. Or uh, I, I did, I, uh, you know, changed my pentomino board representation to this also, but it didn't seem to speed anything up. Well, uh, in those cases, yeah, you need to do more detective work to figure out what happened. So a lot of times the performance is something like a max of bunch of different things. So you have done something, that's great. It should give you a huge performance improvement, but something is holding. And a lot of times you have to do three or four things, and once you have done three or four things, suddenly everything starts kicking off. Things like uh, 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 good examples, loop unroll. You unroll the loop and say, ah, I should get all these files. Some no, because you have some dependence. So you have fixed that dependence, fixed that dependence, suddenly you remove everything. Then you get all the parallelism and start running fast. So a lot of these things is basically max. You have to get all the things right. And so if you stop the halfway through, that means you might be almost there and you, you, you are not up to that. So that's why it's, it's, it just it can be a very frustrating process. But it's kind of fun too when you get there. <laughs>